This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Natural History of Selborne by Gilbert White. Reader's Note Within the following text, occasional names have been blanked out. In my reading I have replaced these with the word blank. End of reader's note. Invitation to Selborne See, Selborne spreads her boldest beauties Round the varied valley and the mountain ground, Wildly majestic. What is all the pride of flats With loads of ornaments supplied, Unpleasing, tasteless, impotent expense, compared with nature's rude magnificence. Arise, my stranger, to these wild scenes haste. The unfinished farm awaits your forming taste. Plan the pavilion, airy, light, and true. Through the high arch, call in the lengthening view. Expand the forest, sloping up the hill. Swell to a lake the scant penurious rill. Extend the vista, raise the castle mound In antique taste with turrets ivy-crowned. O'er the gay lawn the flowery shrub dispread, Or with the blending garden mix the mead. Bid China's pale fantastic fence delight, Or with the mimic statue trap the sight. Oft on some evening, sunny, soft, and still, The muse shall lead thee to the beech-grown hill, To spend in tea the cool, refreshing hour, Where nods in air the pensile, nest-like bower, Or where the hermit hangs the straw-clad cell, Emerging gently from the leafy dell, By fancy planned, as once the inventive maid Met the hoar sage amid the secret shade, Romantic spot, from whence in prospect lies Whate'er of landscape charms our feasting eyes. The pointed spire, the hall, the pasture plain, The russet fallow or the golden grain, The breezy lake that sheds a gleaming light Till all the fading pictures fail the sight. Each to his task, all different ways retire, Cull the dry stick, Call forth the seeds of fire, Deep fix the kettle's props a forky row, Or give with fanning hat the breeze to blow. Whence is this taste, the furnished hall forgot, To feast in gardens, or the unhandy grot, Or novelty with some new charms of surprises, Or from our very shifts some joy arises? Hark, while below the village bells ring round, Echo, sweet nymph, returns the softened sound. But if gusts arise, the rushing forests roar Like the tide tumbling on the pebbly shore. Adown the vale, in lone sequestered nook, Where skirting woods inbrown the dimpling brook, The ruined convent lies. Here wont to dwell the lazy canon Midst his cloistered cell while papal darkness brooded o'er the land, ere reformation made her glorious stand. Still oft at eve belated shepherd swains see the cowled spectre skim the folded plains. To the high temple would my stranger go, the mountain brow commands the woods below. In Jewry first this order found a name, when madding crusades set the world in flame, When western climes, urged on by pope and priest, Poured forth their minions o'er the deluged east. Luxurious knights, ill-suited to defy to mortal fight, Turkestan chivalry. Nor be the parsonage by the muse forgot, The partial bard admires his native spot, Smit with its beauties, loved, as yet a child, unconscious why, its capes grotesque and wild, high on a mound, the exalted gardens stand, 
beneath deep valleys scooped by nature's hand. A cobham here, exulting in his art, might blend the generals with the gardener's part, might fortify with all the martial trade of rampart, bastion, fosse, and palisade, might plant the mortar with wide threatening bore, or bid the mimic cannon seem to roar. Now climb the steep, drop now your eye belong where round the blooming village orchards grow. There, like a picture, lies my lowly seat, a rural, sheltered, unobserved retreat. Me, far above the rest, Selbornian scenes, the pendant forest and the mountain greens, strike with delight. There spreads the distant view that gradual fades till sunk in misty blue. Here nature hangs her slopy woods to sight. Rills pearl between, and dart a quivering light. Selborne Hanger, a winter piece, to the Miss B. The bard, who sang so late in blithest strain Selbornean prospects and the rural rain, now suits his plaintive pipe to saddened tone, while the blank swains the changeful year bemoan. How fallen the glories of these fading scenes! The dusty beech resigns his vernal greens, The yellow maple mourns in sickly hue, And russet woodlands crowd the darkening view. Dim, clustering fogs involve the country round, The valley and the blended mountain ground Sink in confusion, but with tempest wing Should Boreas from his northern barrier spring the rushing woods with deafening clamour roar, Like the sea tumbling on the pebbly shore. When spouting rains descend in torrent tides, See the torn zigzag weep its channelled sides. Winter exerts its rage. Heavy and slow from the keen east rolls on the treasured snow. Sunk with its weight the bending boughs are seen, And one bright deluge whelms the works of men. Amidst this savage landscape, bleak and bare, Hangs the chill hermitage in the middle air, Its haunts forsaken and its feasts forgot, A leaf-strown, lonely, desolated cot. Is this the scene that late with rapture rang, Where Delphi danced, and gentle Anna sang, With fairy step where Harriet tripped so late, And on her stump reclined, the musing kitty sate. Return, dear nymphs, prevent the purple spring, Ere the soft nightingale essays to sing, Ere the first swallow sweeps the freshening plain, Ere lovesick turtles breathe their amorous pain. Let festive glee the enlivened village raise, Pan's blameless reign and patriarchal days. With pastoral dance the smitten swain surprise, and bring all Arcady before our eyes. Return, blithe maidens, with you bring along free native humour, all the charms of song, the feeling heart, and unaffected ease, each nameless grace, and every power to please. November the 1st, 1763 On the Rainbow Look upon the rainbow, and praise him that made it. Very beautiful is it, in the brightness thereof. Ecclesiastes 43, verse 11 On morning, or on evening cloud impressed, bent in vast curve, the watery meteor shines delightfully to the levelled sun opposed, lovely refraction. While the vivid breed in listed colours glows, The unconscious swain with vacant eyes Gazes on the divine phenomenon, Gleaming o'er the illumined fields, Or runs to catch the treasures which it sheds. Not so the sage. Inspired with pious awe, He hails the federal arch, And looking up, adores that God Whose fingers formed this bow magnificent, Compassing heaven about, With a resplendent verge, Thou madest the cloud, maker omnipotent, 
and thou the bow, and by that covenant graciously hast sworn never to drown the world again. Henceforth, till time shall be no more, in ceaseless round, season shall follow season, day to night, summer to winter, harvest to seed time, heat shall to cold in regular array succeed, heaven taught. So sang the Hebrew bard. A Harvest Scene Waked by the gentle gleamings of the morn, soon clad the reaper provident of want, Hies cheerful-hearted to the ripened field, nor hastes alone, attendant by his side his faithful wife, sole partner of his cares, bears on her breast the sleeping babe, behind with steps unequal trips her infant train, thrice happy pair in love and labour joined. All day they ply their task, with mutual chat beguiling each the sultry tedious hours. Around them falls in rows the severed corn, or the shocks rise in regular array. But when high noon invites to short repast, beneath the shade of sheltering thorn they sit, divide the simple meal and drain the cask. The swinging cradle lulls the whimpering babe meantime, while growling round, if at the tread of hasty passenger alarmed, as of their store protective, stalks the cur with bristling back to guard the scanty scrip and russet frock. On the dark, still, dry, warm weather occasionally happening in the winter months, the imprisoned winds slumber within their caves, fast bound, the fickle vein, emblem of change, wavers no more, long settling to a point. All nature, nodding, seems composed. Thick steams from land, from flood updrawn, dimming the day. Like a dark ceiling stand, slow through the air gossamer floats or stretched from blade to blade the wavy network whitens all the field. Pushed by the weightier atmosphere, up springs the ponderous mercury, from scale to scale mounting, amidst the Torricellian tube. While high in air, and poised upon his wings, unseen, the soft enamoured woodlark runs through all his maze of melody. The break loud with the blackbird's bolder note, resounds. Soothed by the genial warmth, the cawing rook anticipates the spring, selects her mate, haunts her tall nest-trees, and with sedulous care repairs her wicker eerie, tempest-torn. The ploughman inly smiles to see upturn his mellow globe, best pledge of future crop. With glee the gardener eyes his smoking beds, E'en pining sickness feels a short relief. The happy schoolboy brings transported forth His long-forgotten scourge, and giddy gig, O'er the white paths he whirls the rolling hoop, Or triumphs in the dusty fields of Tor. Not so the museful sage. Abroad he walks contemplative, If haply he may find, what cause controls the tempest rage, or whence, amidst the savage season, winter smiles? For days, for weeks, prevails the placid calm. At length some drops preclude a change. The sun, with ray refracted, bursts the parting gloom, when all the chequered sky is one bright glare. Mutters the wind at eve. The horizon round with angry aspect scowls. Down rush the showers, and float the deluge paths, and miry fields. THE NATURAL HISTORY OF SELBORN In a series of letters addressed to Thomas Pennant, Esquire, and the Honourable Danes Barrington, the author of the following letters takes the liberty, with all proper deference, of laying before the public his idea of parochial history, which, he thinks, ought to consist of natural productions and occurrences as well as antiquities. He is also of opinion that, if stationary men would pay some attention to the districts on which they reside, 
and would publish their thoughts respecting the objects that surround them, from such materials might be drawn the most complete county histories, which are still wanting in several parts of this kingdom, and in particular in the county of Southampton. And here he seizes the first opportunity, though a late one, of returning his most grateful acknowledgments to the Reverend the President and the Reverend and Worthy the Fellows of Magdalen College in the University of Oxford, for the liberal behaviour in permitting their archives to be searched by a member of their own society, so far as the evidences therein contained might respect the parish and priory of Selborne. To that gentleman also, and his assistant, whose labours and attention could only be equalled by the very kind manner in which they were bestowed, many and great obligations are also due. Of the authenticity of the documents above mentioned, there can be no doubt, since they consist of the identical deeds and records that were removed by the college from the priory at the time of its dissolution, and being carefully copied on the spot, may be depended on as genuine, and never having been made public before, may gratify the curiosity of the antiquary, as well as establish the credit of the history. If the writer should at all appear to have induced any of his readers to pay a more ready attention to the wonders of the creation, too frequently overlooked as common occurrences, or if he should by any means through his researches have lent an helping hand towards the enlargement of the boundaries of historical and topographical knowledge, or if he should have thrown some small light upon ancient custom and manners, and especially on those that were monastic, his purpose will be fully answered. But if he should not have been successful in any of these his intentions, yet there remains this consolation behind, that these his pursuits, by keeping the body and mind employed, have, under providence, contributed to much health and cheerfulness of spirits, even to old age, and what still adds to his happiness, have led him to the knowledge of a circle of gentlemen whose intelligent communications, as they have afforded him much pleasing information, so could he flatter himself with a continuation of them, would they ever be deemed a matter of singular satisfaction and improvement. Gilbert White, Selborne, January the 1st, 1788 the end of the preface to the natural history of selborne by gilbert white